This podcast is sponsored by SaltWorks Security. For almost 10 years, SaltWorks has delivered world-class application security services and products designed to help enterprises secure their applications from policy to production in an ever-changing security landscape. They're the makers of SaltMiner, an application security management platform designed by security professionals for security professionals. SaltMiner aggregates and normalizes the issues found by many different solutions and enriches that data with business context. SaltMiner gives team members from the C-suite, security, and development teams the ability to manage their application security program through customizable views. The SaltWorks SaltMiner Community Edition is a free penetration testing management and delivery application. It provides teams with custom reporting for potentially thousands of end users, red team support, and the ability to manage new and retesting of engagements. SaltMiner Community Edition also allows teams to enforce both testing methodologies and custom vulnerability databases for consistency in engagement delivery. Check them out today at saltworks.io. This podcast is sponsored by Bright Payment Solutions. They provide merchant services for a wide variety of credit card companies. They take most major credit cards at the lowest rates and fees possible, and they can help your business generate higher revenue through a variety of payment solutions they have, including their own point of sale equipment and custom software. If you take credit cards for your business, you should contact them and see how they can help you. Go to brighteps.com and tell them Scott Moore from the SMC Journal sent you. All right, it's time again for the SMC Journal podcast. This is the show where we talk about software engineering and IT today, DevOps, performance, security, reliability, observability, um, all these things. Today's topic is about security. I'm Scott Moore, your host, and I appreciate you being on the show with me today. Uh, distributed denial of service attacks or DDoS attacks are on the rise and have skyrocketed in the last few years. And as a performance engineer, I think about a DDoS attack very similar to what we call a stress test, where we just generate load as much as we can, as fast as we can to try to see the breakpoint of the servers. But when a DDoS attack is happening out in production, uh, this is something that's done mostly by bots, not actually by somebody running a test. And because of that, the, the attacks are sometimes volume based, but they actually are getting smarter. And because of that, we in IT have to be smarter to know how to mitigate the risk of having a denial of service attack hit us. Because when they happen, they're not only trying to refuse service to legitimate customers who are trying to access those resources, they're also using up those resources and they're costing you money at, at the same time. So it's a bad thing if you are not preparing to deal with bot traffic, number one, and two, denial of service attacks that are caused by these bots. So I wanted to bring on somebody who, for a living, works for a company that helps people do this. They help them uh, get rid of denial of service attacks on their side. Although you can't get rid of them, you can mitigate the risk of them and you can do things to, uh, to lower your chances of being taken down when a denial of service attack comes against your site or your application. So I want to bring on Ron Foster from SaltWorks Security, one of our major sponsors of the show, to talk about DDoS attacks, what they are, and what we can do about them, and how we can deal with all of these bots hitting our sites. Hey, Ron Foster, welcome back to the SMC Journal podcast. Oh, it's good to be here, man. I hope you're doing well. Today's show, I really wanted to talk about the distributed denial of service attacks and DDoS attacks, because that's something that keeps popping up. And I and there was an article that came out recently, and I want to show this, that uh, NetScout was talking about DDoS attacks have actually jumped sixfold since 2019. So throughout the pandemic and even post, it, we're not getting necessarily better since all these companies have done digital transformation. We're actually probably getting a little worse and we're seeing more of this. So I wanted to have you on the show so we could kind of talk through this, like what it is, the types of attacks that we're seeing out there and what companies can actually do to start mitigating this problem because if they're not doing it, it could be very dangerous for them. So um, what do you think about this? Does it surprise you that uh, DDoS attacks are way up? 
Uh, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. Just in the last week, we've been, you know, if we've been following any of the hacker news type stuff, we've seen the attacks on Node.js. We've seen the attacks on Prime Minister Trudeau's website. We've seen an article come out by Cloudflare about how the attacks themselves are shifting. So, you know, no, it's no surprise. Not at all. And this is going to keep getting worse. And uh, it's really important to actually have good mitigation strategies for this. So let's let's define that for people who aren't familiar with DDoS. What is a distributed denial of service attack? What is it? Well, let's let's do it in a real simple way, and we're going to talk about volume based attacks in a little bit. But you know, we're low testers here, and we know that there's tools out there like Blaze Meter, or Flood IO, or Frugal Testing. And what are they doing? They're generating a lot of traffic. Now, let's say we were doing that from a bunch of different locations. Hey, uh, say we had load generators in you know 50 different places and different locales, even in different countries. Um, we could kick off traffic from all those at the same time, and in doing so, flood the site with so much information, as we've seen as performance engineers so many times, that we slow down the site or make it unavailable for the people who actually want to use it. So the purpose would be different if you were doing load testing. There's there's one type of load test that we would run. We call it a stress test, right? That's where we remove all the think time. Because typically when you do a, a performance test that's realistic, you, you want to make it the perfect storm, but you want to make it under real conditions. So not everybody's running at machine speed, but when you re remove all that think time, then all your generators are running load at exponential rates. And so really the purpose for that from a performance standpoint is just to see where the first point of failure is actually going to occur. But when this happens, when you use that tool as a denial of service attack, there's a different purpose for for that. It's you're trying to prevent real users from actually being able to use the system. You're just blocking them, right? You're trying to cause an outage. That is literally what you're trying to do. You're trying to cause the Black Friday go down of a website, but you're doing it artificially and you're doing it oftentimes through botnets. And yeah. even that's starting to shift. And that's the point I, I kind of want to get at. When you're running a load test, it's usually somebody has kicked off a test and they're they're running it. Uh, and they're watching it, and then they they stop it. There's safety nets, but uh, this kind of stuff is all bot driven now, and it it's is. it's not just volume based. I, I found I want to bring up this graphic here. I found this from Toolbox that talks about there are basically three different types of DDoS attacks, and the one we're talking about right now are volume based attacks, but there's also protocol based and application layer based. Can you talk to each of these and just talk about what the differences might be between these and, and what why there might be different ones? Well, it's just really where you're attacking it at specific layers. So we know the application layer, if you've done your OSI, OSI model, we're attacking it at that layer. And even at the protocol layer, so say we're hitting a specific port, we're hitting point four four three or something of that nature, they're attacking specific either application layer interfaces or they're attacking ports. You know, so it's just we have to look at how to mitigate those. Oftentimes it's shutting them down or redirecting traffic that's, that we know is once we get it fingerprinted, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, to a different network. But uh, that's really what we're looking at there. So when we're looking at the volume stuff, we're looking at just general volume. We're looking at application. We're hitting the application layer. And uh, the third type you had there is just think ports, think protocols, think sockets, think things of that nature. So let me, let me think through this. If I'm application layer, that might be if somebody's using a specific JavaScript framework and I can figure out how to, to, to pummel load at the JavaScript level or Node.js for, for whatever, even if it's like you get behind the firewall and you're looking at underneath the, the browser level, but you're still not at the protocol level, sort of that mid-level, you're kind of attacking a known vulnerability to take that resource away. But then from a protocol perspective, it may not be web traffic, port 80, port 443, it might be uh, you found that they've got SSH open up and you just want to flood that port so that nobody else can log in and get in there and control the system. So you basically have control if nobody else can get in. Is that right? That's true. And I mean, we've seen attacks like that happen a lot because how many Git repos are out there that have uh, credentials or, or, or keys out there for APIs and things of that nature. And a lot of people will run their APIs on different ports so that they're not standard ports. And that helps give them some level of obfuscation. But if they have all their stuff out on a Git repo and that stuff gets exposed, then you'll see uh, that's an attack vector. Attackers will get those creds and they'll start using APIs, for example, as an attack vector. So you said that a lot of this is changing. Like, how is this morphing now versus five years ago? 
Well, if you think about traditional, you know, DDoS attacks, we always think about the the Trojan viruses, the botnets. Someone would download a virus or something of that nature. They visit a site with those horrible 50 pop-ups. They get it on there and they get this kind of living on their machine until they get the signal from the from the bad actor saying it's go time. And when it's go time, all the machines from all over the world that have this you know, this this virus or this Trojan on there kicks off their their attack. That's beginning to shift. We see, I mean. IoT has taken over everything. We have, you know, security cameras in our home. We have all types of digital assistants in our home. We have printers. We have refrigerators and stoves and dryers and washers that all have, you know, API calls going back and forth. And a lot of times we're finding that those are getting exposed and, and attackers are finding ways to use these IoT devices or even virtual private infrastructure now. The cloud itself is an attack vector. So the, the attacks are starting to shift to the cloud and to IoT in a lot of ways. Well, wow, so I'm, I, I was thinking in terms of because everybody has moved to the cloud, um, if I see a whole bunch of traffic coming to me that's trying to overload me, but it's all coming from AWS anonymous nodes, I just start shutting off AWS traffic and look for traffic that's coming from legitimate sources like Comcast or something like that. But that's not the case if you're talking about Internet of Things. So literally, we're those are, I would consider those like little web servers out there. My refrigerator's got a little web server in it or a server, API server. We're turning or they are turning those into little zombies basically to go inside to, to, to the back end of, of those servers. And then they're pushing out more traffic to another server. So it looks like it's coming from them. Is that is that what we're talking about? That's exactly what we're talking about. I mean, how many times have you seen a, a, a webcam was placed in a baby room, like a baby monitor, and you've seen where the people viewed their baby or something like that? And this is just a simple example. And what did they have to do? They had to patch the software. You had to download an upgrade for the firmware, and that would close that, you know, that that hole up so it couldn't be exploited. Well, that's, I mean, how, when's the last time you patched your refrigerator? Yeah. When's the last time you saw an update come for your, you know, the manufacturers themselves aren't updating the software. So they are, they just become these vulnerable web servers that are out there and they're ripe for the picking. Well, you know, when I talk to people that are in the industry, such as you, and you do this all the time, I just wonder like, how do you sleep at night? Number one, <laughs> how do you just like not want to go into the woods and just turn off all, all technology because everything is an attack vector. It really is. And, and you have to think that way. And when I'm, you know, when we have, uh, you know, juniors come up or whatever, I tell them all the time, I was like, as you're, as you're learning to, to do AppSec and InfoSec, understand that there is no real security. It's just a matter of time. If someone has enough time and enough effort, they will usually figure out a way. It may take them decades, but they'll find a way. And it's just how persistent do people want to be? How persistent do bad actors want to be? But as far as sleeping at night, I don't know, man. I just... I take some sleeping, uh, yeah, some melatonin, and I crash. That's some what I do. Chamomile, maybe. <laughs> I can't worry about it. I, can't, I just can't worry about it, you know? Yeah, so you can protect yourself. Uh, at least you can do that. So there's a couple of things I also want to bring up on the screen to talk about, because I was doing some research on this, and I found on the Imperva website, they have this uh, site that talks about what you can do as far as mitigating some of this. And that's really what I wanted to get to, is how can companies – come across a mitigation strategy for DDoS. And, and a, really, it's more than that. It's DDoS and it's bot mitigation. Because you may have bots not trying to take your site down, but they may be wanting to do like competitive analysis of your store versus their store. And they're trying to figure out what your prices are. And they're doing all that through bots. That's still taking up resources and denying a real user from buying your stuff. So you need to have kind of both. And that, now they talk about here, there's kind of four stages here. You, you, you have to detect it. So you have to know when there's an anomaly and when there's something wrong, then you have to do something with that. Once you detect, you have to divert it somewhere or you have to filter it. You have to somehow get it out of the, the normal traffic routine. And then you have to have a way to, I guess, visualize and see if this thing is actually working. Um, so you're the expert though. You tell me, is, is this a great way to start? And if Absolutely. so, what are in these stages, detection, diversion, filtering? How does how does that one go about doing that? What are the tools and the things, techniques that you do to do this? So, and you also hear it called detection, response, routing, and adaptation. That's another take on it as well. So you'll hear that. And detection is in both of those types of models. And the first thing is we need to identify 
something bad's happening. We, we have this traffic flow coming in and there's a deviation in it. It's deviating somehow from standard web traffic. And, and that kind of goes into our next thing is once we can kind of detect this, fingerprint it, see what's different in it. And that's either going to be done through some type of SEIM appliance or you're going to be using some type of web-based provider, like say a Cloudflare or something of that nature. Then you're going to get into this diversion or response stage, depending on which model you want to look at, where basically we're just dropping packets from that. We're dropping or we're sending it off somewhere else. We're, we're just sending it to nowhere land, a null, the bit bucket, you know, a uh, null route. And then we get into this third section, which, you know, is either the filtering, which we're trying to weed out this traffic now, or a routing, depending on which model you're in. So we're intelligently moving this traffic, uh, you know, and we're, we're trying to take the remaining traffic, that's the good traffic, in manageable trunks so that our site doesn't go down. You know, so this is where we get into this filtering kind of stage. And then the last one is this adaptation or analysis. Now my network has adapted to the stuff. We have good patterns for uh, analyzing this specific traffic. We have the bad patterns that we're seeing, and we see this through either the analysis stage as in Pervo or the adaptation stage, uh, depending on which kind of model you use. So uh, it's both of those uh, things kind of say the same thing, but that's really what we're looking at there. We're just looking at seeing what this stuff is, sending it to somewhere where it, you know, that so it's not harming us, taking the good stuff that we want to keep. So we're trying to stay up and we're not seeing downtime to our end users. And then looking at what's left and creating some type of heuristics so that, you know, we have all this stuff fingerprinted within our network. Let's talk about some specific examples and ways to do that. This, this also comes from the Imperva site. And it really is about, okay, you, you, how you detect it and then what is your response? And these are things that people can see. And this is stuff that Cloudflare does as well. And, and what you mentioned, some other companies do this too, but this is what they do. Um, they're talking about detecting it, detecting the anomaly based on a couple of things. Number one, the reputation. All right. If this is coming from known bad actors out there, we have IP ranges or something. We can totally do something about that. Um, if the client needs to validate to say that it is a, like, are you a robot? It may have to do something in response uh, to make sure that it's not a bot. And then the statistical analysis shows that based on <laughs> from this specific country or countries, they have a lot of bad actors. We should probably look at them way more closely. I think people know what I'm talking about. Then you have all these different responses. And, and obviously you can get as aggressive as you need to based upon the a security level that you need or the sensitivity of the application. And you could overdo it too, but I think err on the side of, of caution that, okay, let's get a little more aggressive and then we can always back off of it. But we have things like whitelisting IPs uh, and blacklisting IPs. We have just monitoring and making sure that nothing is going on, having an active monitor there. Then you have like a challenge response or form fields that people have to fill out. And then the obvious one is just, we just, we just block all traffic period. So um, does that match kind of how you would advise a client uh, from Saltworks, like in general, what they, what their options are to be able to reroute and block bad actors? Absolutely. And, and it's funny too, because we mentioned like your very first one there, sender reputation. And that's actually how the Node.js attack went down. Because when we look at open source repos, when search engines usually rank them higher and they're ranked higher because they have a better reputation. But we can we can create, you know, empty NPM modules and put uh, rogue sites in the readme.md files. And then once people start accessing those repos, all this stuff starts getting propagated. So and why did that work? Because they are considered to be re reputable. So and that's, you know, it was a very short attack because once again, we figured out the, you know, well, not we, but, you know, someone figured out what was going on and shut that down. So, a uh, you know, and. But yes, that strategy is a perfect strategy. And let me even put on top of that, even having a strategy is good, but actually having some tabletop exercises where your team can actually do that. You know, if you need to engage someone like a Saltworks or, or a third party to help you generate uh, neutered payloads for a network attacks or something of that nature, nature, so that you have something to go on so that you can begin creating those rules or have an exercise so you can go end to end, hey, this is happening. This is how we're going to respond. Just like any other uh, tabletop exercise when you're doing red team, purple team exercises, blue team exercises, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. This all, you know, until you do it, even if you're doing it, you know, in a tabletop exercise, you're you're not really going to know how frantic and crazy it is trying to get it shut down. 
You know, I think about like email. Let's just go back to basic SMTP email. Like right now, if I said, I don't want to have Google Gmail. I don't want to have any. I want to have my own mail server at home. It sounds like a fine idea. You're never going to get mail to anybody because of that reputation, right? You used to be able to do that in the early days of the web, but you try to have your own SMTP server. Everybody's going to block you unless you're on this known good actor list because a few people, few bad people spoiled it for everybody. I think, do you think that's kind of where we're going to with the cloud flares of the world? They're trying to create that same sort of, I know it's, it sounds non-distributed. It sounds more centralized, like they're controlling the gate, but that model seems to be working a little bit for spam, right? No, it, it works for lots of things. And I'll tell you what, as a pen tester, I hate seeing Cloudflare. I mean, I, I, I don't usually plug a vendor, but man, I mean, I already know if you're using Cloudflare, my job's going to be more difficult because they're good at what they do. They're good at filtering traffic. Yeah. And as a, as a tester, when you look there and you start seeing this little proxy header come up and you know they're starting to redirect your stuff through a proxy, you know, oh man, they're already looking at what I'm doing. They're, they're looking at my traffic because that's what that proxy's for. It's, they're moving it through there to do their fingerprinting. And it's just like, you know, and you know, it's a matter of time before you're shut down and you've got to find another IP address to work from, you know, so it's, you know, it's a good time. So Cloudflare is a great product. Yeah, I have I, all my web servers are on Cloudflare. If, Cloudflare, if you'd like to be a sponsor, please contact me after the show. But um, <laughs> we won't talk about that. No, no. Um, so one, one other question here before we kind of land this plane is about the role. Everybody's talking about AI and how it's going to take over the world and it's going to do everybody's job for you. But do you think legitimately, can we use AI and machine learning to make this stuff smarter, better and faster to lock this stuff down, shape the traffic in almost real time? I mean, are we are we there yet? We're not there yet, but I think it's coming and I think it's going to be awesome. And when we look already at these edge appliances that are already out there, which do this fingerprinting and they do it through different algorithms, through different heuristics engines, things of that nature to do that type of filtering. I can't imagine where we're going to be with AI. I mean, that 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 type of stuff actually gets me excited. I know that mm -hmm. some people are scared of AI. I think we all are in some degrees to what, you know, the negatives of kind of what it can do. We see that people can generate, you know, malware. But, you know, if it can generate the malware, it can also help us generate the defenses. So yeah. it's 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 a great tool on the red and blue side. So, yeah, it's coming. It's it's it, it's in process and it's exciting. Yeah, I, I kind of get excited a little bit about it, too, because I, I like the I think that if it takes more effort for the bad guys to go around because they know they're going to get shut down almost immediately uh, by dynamic rules that are generated, to just get them the more effort it takes them. Most people like that, I would think, unless they're just really determined, they're going after the low hanging fruit. It's like the thieves. They go into a house that hopefully nobody's home. Uh, hopefully they don't have any way to protect themselves if they are home. And so they go for the low hanging fruit first. And maybe that gets rid of the, just the, the bottom rung. And then the stuff you got to really deal with, that's going to be the harder stuff. You're always going to have that, but you can focus on that. Right. Absolutely. Unless you've made yourself a target, you know, you've, you've really angered somebody for some reason or whatever, you know, you made a chocolate that nobody liked. I don't know, but you know, they're Please come hack my site. <laughs> Please give so, me a yeah. denial of service attack. <laughs> you know, having, having these edge appliances or having a web-based system like Cloudflare, it's going to get you far. Yeah, that's great. Well, Ron, thanks again for being on the show. We like to have you on as often as we can to talk about these security issues. Uh, anything else going on with you or SaltWorks that we should be aware of going on right now? Uh, just we're working on this uh, salt miner pen test uh, product. We're excited about that. That's going to be released very soon. So if you are doing any type of pen testing out there, uh, we're going to be having a free community tool that's coming out and it's going to be killer. I mean, I, I don't really know what to say about it. I'm really excited about it. All right, Ron, we'll see you soon. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It will be interesting to see how AI and machine learning changes the way not only we deal with and shape the traffic dynamically uh, to deal with DDoS attacks, but also how the DDoS attacks themselves are going to morph. So it is a spy versus spy, tit for tat sort of game that's being played between the, the people who are uh, initiating, the bad actors who are initiating this, and the people who are trying to um, proactively deal with this. We don't want to be reactive to these things. So that was 
part of the reason of the show. So what do you think? Are you seeing uh, this play out in the market yourselves? What do you think is going to happen? Would love to hear your feedback. I can be reached very easily on most social platforms, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and others. If you scan the QR code, it'll take you to my bio and show you how to find out where to get in touch with me. But as a last resort, uh, or maybe your first resort, contact me through email at heyscott at smcjournal.com and always willing to take it and hear your feedback about the show and what you'd like to hear next. Uh, when we talk about security, there's other topics I'd like to deal with in the future, which is uh, ransomware. Uh, how do we deal with uh, container-based deployed applications and what are the security risks around that versus traditional microservices uh, and API security. All of these things uh, in the same realm that we talk about performance, we should be thinking about security as well. And if you like this kind of content, it would be great if you liked this video and you subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's how you can actually get directly to the channel. But if you're watching this on YouTube, you're already there. But if you're watching it from somewhere else, that's how you get to us directly. It'd be great if you subscribe to our channel. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next.